In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Today is the first Sunday of the Blessed Month of Hathor. And the theme of this month will be about the Word of God and the effect of the Word on our lives. The first two Sundays, today and next Sunday, will be about the Bible and um, will be about this, the parable of the sower. We read from the Gospel of Luke chapter 8 today, and the next week we'll read from Matthew chapter 13, but the same parable. Um, the third week is about the, uh, the taking up your cross, the message of taking up your cross. And the fourth week is responding to the message, go and sell what you have, right? So those are the kind of the four uh, Sundays of this month. And our Lord, uh, in this gospel, what's nice about it is that he gives us four responses to his preaching about the kingdom of God. In Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 8, he gives us these four responses, and then what's nice is that he explains the meaning in verses 9 through 15. So as a quick summary, um, some of the seed is, is sown, but it doesn't even have a chance to sprout. The birds swoop down and they pick it up. And according to our Lord Jesus Christ, the devil is taking the word out of their hearts. Some seed sprouts, but there's no moisture. And it's on shallow ground. And at the heat of the day, the temptation comes, and the little plant shrivels up and dies. And then there is seed that sprouts, but there's no fruit. And it grows, but it's choked out by the weeds, and it dies because there is no fruit. And so only some of the seed gets good soil. Only some of the seed grows and bears crop. So our, our church fathers tell us that who is the sower? It's none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. The sower went out, went out to sow. This going out refers to the incarnation, right? And the seed is the word of God, those words that he spoke, right? And so the sower went out to sow. Christ was incarnate and became man to give us his seed that we may bear fruit. So we have the same sower, we have the same seed, but in the story, in the parable, everyone receives the seed very differently. The difference is the reaction. So what's different is the type of ground. And to be honest, this depends on us. That's why our Lord says, he who, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Because it depends on the individual. The reaction of the seed depends on the soil that we harvest. So our Lord tells us that there are four different responses to hearing the word of God. There are four different responses to hearing the word of God. And only one of the four responses bears fruit. It brings us to a more proper relationship with God. Only one of the four. Only one of the responses brings us salvation. Only one of the four leads us to eternal life. Only one response. It's good that our Lord reminds us of the difficulty of the path when he says, narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. And there are few who find it. We have four possible responses to our, Lord, our, our Lord's word. We can ignore it completely. We can avoid it at all costs. We can accept it with enthusiasm, but then sometimes that's brief and short-lived. We can accept it and we can turn away later as the cares and the worries and the responsibilities begin to pile up against us. And then we can accept his word, and this word, like a seed, can take root and blossom and bear good fruit. This is the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. St. Paul mentions in Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is the fruit. So, to me, the question of today is, how can we take, how can we prepare our own hearts 
to receive the seed of the word of God faithfully. The church stands as a hospital for us. It's a place that cures the sick. We come here because we're sick. We come here because something is off. Not because we have it all perfectly handled and then we come to church. The church is a hospital, but not simply a hospital. It's also a school of repentance, a school of prayer. And as we reflect on this, we realize that they are medicine. And these are practices that help us undergo the purification of our souls. And it's this purification that helps us develop good soil, especially in our hearts. These things help us follow the word of God faithfully to the end. To become those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bring forth fruit with patience, we have to understand the church is a hospital and we have to obey and take our medicine. The chalice is, is usually brought out for communion every single Sunday. And if you notice, it's usually plated with gold. Have you ever noticed that? And it reminds us, it should point us, our minds, to the precious nature of that which it's carrying. The gospel cover, right, is usually wrapped with a beautiful decorative cover, and it's usually with some kind of gold plating. Again, to, in order to remind us and to put our minds of the precious quality of the words that are contained in them. In the same way, we are called to make ourselves purified, cleansed vessels in order for the precious seed of God's word to take root in our hearts in a very fitting and acceptable manner. Everything in the life of the Orthodox Church is meant to, us to, to help us on this path, this narrow path. We are consistently, constantly called to help the poor and the needy, to visit the sick, those prisoners, to clothe the naked, to support the church. Acts as these help us to become detached from wealth and possession. And as Orthodox Christians, you know, there hasn't been a fast that the church didn't like. We fast more than half the year. We undertake other, other, other forms of asceticism. We do prostrations in our private prayers. We stay up late praying, even when it means getting less sleep. We have visuals. We undertake activities that are not easy, they're not convenient. We serve others. We love our enemies. We do these things so that the heart will remain soft. It can become a fertile land for God and not a stony and rocky and hard heart. We don't do these things so that we can be choked by the pleasures of life. Once someone is sucked into the quicksand of the pleasures of life is tough to crawl out. This is why the church offers us her spiritual practices, met these methods that are tried and true and tested. These are according to the lives of the saints who have lived them for centuries. In addition, the church is a, is a wise mother and she gives us powerful medicine to help us grow and to keep us away from various forms of spiritual danger. She gives us the divine liturgy and the Holy Communion, the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. She gives us the support and the fellowship of the whole community, the body of Christ. She gives us the sacrament of confession. All these gifts and many more are given to us because God desired that we would all be saved and we would come to him. Some of us feel that 
there are times in our lives that we simply just go through the motions of our faith. Maybe it's because some of us are already exhausted by the cares and the worries of this world and this life. I want you to remember your purpose and your gift. Your purpose is that you were created to serve and to love God first and foremost. Everything else is secondary. Everything. We have to live with that constant reminder. Everything else is secondary. And your gift, it's important to remember our gift. The gift is that we are given to the adoption into the household of God. It's yours. Everything that the Father has, He shares with you. Everything. He doesn't do it begrudgingly, He does it with openness. In great generosity, he says, come to me. He says, sit with me. He says, know me, partake of me, live with me. As Christians, we are reminded by our Lord, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, that life is short and we should guard it and treasure it and especially his words like precious jewels something that's exceedingly rare. And the best way for us to do this is to hold fast to the practices and discipline of the church, to continually soften our hearts and to train ourselves to be receptive to the grace of God. God desires to save you and to transform you, but he asks you to make room for him, to prepare the soil in your heart, Daily, methodically, habitually. These practices of prayer, this repentance daily, and the participation of the life-giving worship in the church. So we do this day by day, hour by hour. And we believe that if we are diligent to tend the gardens of our hearts, then in time he will faithfully fulfill his promise and bring forth abundant fruit in our lives, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will have a chance to work in our lives. Ultimately, our Lord is not interested in seed or soil or any kind of agriculture and those kind of things, but the condition of your heart. The condition of your heart. This is what the parable is all about. Is the heart serious about knowing God and keeping his word? Or is the heart mediocre and lukewarm in its application of the faith when it's convenient? Is the heart free from thorns and weeds that will choke, that will choke out the, the life, the tree of life, the tree of faith? It's a warning to all of us. We need to cultivate our spiritual lives like we cultivate a, a garden or a farm or a business or a marriage. We don't throw a seed one day and then we find fruits and vegetables the next. It doesn't work like that. We plow and we water and we weed and we fertilize and we check daily. We don't wake up one day to find that we no longer love God. It doesn't happen like that. Just like we don't wake up one day to find that we're in a bad marriage. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't We don't just wake up one day and find out that we're in a failing business. No. These things happen over time. We find that whatever attention that we have invested in our farm... It will yield fruit in that time. Likewise, we find that if we're neglectful, it'll show over time. So to conclude, our Lord Jesus Christ is our treasure. Getting to God involves more than wishful thinking. It involves obedience to all the teachings of Christ, 
and not simply the ones that are convenient or the ones that fit neatly into our personal readings of the Bible or my flawed opinions. Because the church loves Christ as a bride loves her husband. So she finds the teachings of Christ to be sweet and light. She holds them close to her heart and never even thinks to deviate from them. They are a gift given freely out of intense love for us. So how do we cultivate the word of God in our hearts? We start by guarding our hearts as it's written in Proverbs chapter 4. Keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flow the springs of life. This is the primary focus of the Orthodox Church and Orthodox spirituality. Guarding your heart, guarding the senses. Parents need to be careful about what their kids watch. Parents need to be careful about what they watch. Are we careful about what we see and what we hear in, in everything that's around us? Websites and all these kind of things. If we don't get in the habit of guarding our senses, all the fasting, all the prayers, all the vigils will be fruitless. Can you imagine? But if we start with a pure heart, we have a good foundation and good soil. Christ is a sower who plants good seed. Let's allow him the room to plant and to grow in our hearts. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Blessed are they.